Hi again, this is a uh, host Mark Breederland with the Michigan Sea Grant. I'm based in uh, Traverse City, Michigan, and I had the pleasure of serving as the Michigan Sea Grant representative on our Great Lakes Sea Grant crude oil transport team. Our team has members that stretch from Minnesota to New York and Vermont in terms of geography. And I wanna welcome everybody to our fourth webinar of 2019 that's hosted by our Great Lakes Sea Grant crude oil transport network. This webinar series is meant to provide the latest research and resources to stakeholders in the region to inform decision making around this complicated and complex issue. Anyone with a vested interest in how crude oil and associated products move throughout the region will find the content informative. Let me give just a, a few logistics here as we get started. Uh, first, the webinar is being recorded and is gonna be available on the crude oil transport website, which is www.glslcrudeoiltransport.org. The GLSL of course stands for Great Lakes St. Lawrence, crudeoiltransport.org. So we'll look forward to posting that soon. And second, you are invited to submit questions through the question and answer box. So that may be on the bottom of your screen, it may be on the right part of your screen and uh, Geneva and our team down at uh, Ann Arbor uh, Michigan Sea Grant Communications is doing a great job and we'll be managing those. So again, during the session, submit those questions and answers. We'll have a few minutes hopefully at the end for the Q&A session, but no matter what, we will be ending at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. I think those are all my logistics. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Michael Doig. Lieutenant Doig serves as the NOAA Scientific Support Coordinator for the Great Lakes, and he's stationed in Cleveland, Ohio. In his role, he supports the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as a technical expert to the federal on-scene coordinator in the event of a hazardous material spill into the Great Lakes. Lieutenant Doig served as an on-scene scientific support coordinator during the Hurricane Irma and Maria response in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He supported the U.S. Coast Guard during dozens of incidents, from ship grounding to train derailments and industrial accidents. Let me just say that uh, Lieutenant Doig has a very impressive resume, but time does not allow me to detail it, the whole thing. But let me note just a couple other highlights. First, uh, Mike participated in the Deepwater Horizon Natural Resource Damage Assessment aboard the NOAA ship Pisces. He has dual master's degrees in science education and public policy, a 1600 ton US Coast Guard license, and he's a master scuba diver amongst other things. And I think on this anniversary of 9-11, I wanna really thank Mike for your service and we're really glad to have you here in the Great Lakes. Mike is here with us to discuss NOAA scientific support for oil spills. I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Thank you very much. All right, thanks Mark for that uh, excellent introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's here with me today, taking uh, the time out of your busy days and busy schedules to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about NOAA scientific support uh, for oil spills. Um, I'd also just like to thank Geneva um, for putting this together and the Michigan Sea Grant for hosting these, these webinars. Um, so let's get into um, the discussion about NOAA scientific support for oil spills. So the office that I work with is the uh, Office of Response and Restoration, also known as ORNR. And what we do is develop uh, scientific solutions um, to keep the coast clear from threats of oil, uh, chemical spills, and marine debris. Um, we do this through a few different avenues. Um, we do it through planning and preparedness because obviously the best oil spill is one that doesn't happen. Uh, we do it through emergency response. Um, we do it through damage assessment and also restoration and recovery. And I'll talk a little bit more about how those uh, kind of come together uh, under the umbrella of the Office of Response and Restoration. Um, our organizational structure uh, looks like this. Uh, we have basically five uh, divisions. Um, we have the Disaster Preparedness Program, uh, the Emergency Response Division, uh, the Assessment and Restoration Division, uh, Marine Debris Program, and the Business Services Group. 
Uh, so the Disaster Preparedness Program is based out of uh, Mobile, Alabama, and their focus is preparedness and incident coordination across uh, the National Ocean Service, which is one of the line offices of NOAA. And so during large events such as hurricanes or something uh, uh, you know, major like the Deepwater Horizon spill, uh, the Disaster Pre Preparedness Program would coordinate that information and get that information up to decision makers. Uh, as a scientific support coordinator, I work for the Emergency Response Division, and our focus is preparedness and response for oil and chemical spills in coastal waters. Uh, ARD is another um, one of the divisions, and their focus is the assessment and restoration of injuries to the public's natural resources from oil and chemical spills. Uh, they also work with hazardous waste sites and vessel groundings, among other things. Uh, the Marine Debris Program, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about them, but they do some really interesting stuff. If you guys have heard about microplastics in water or the uh, garbage patch in the Pacific, um, other things like that, uh, that's kind of their focus. Um, and then obviously the Business Services Group kind of helps uh, the office continue uh, to provide these services. So the continuum of response for ORNR kind of looks a little bit like this. Um, during an incident, uh, once you know chemicals and oil are being released into the environment, the ship's on fire, uh, pipelines actively spilling, um, the emergency response division uh, is activated. And we, um, our, our response can last anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks or possibly even longer, depending on the scale of the, the spill. But over time, as the active response uh, diminishes, the assessment and restoration division starts to take over and find ways to help that environment recover. Um, they're trying to look at um, getting that environment or that, um, uh, you know, those natural resources back to the pre-spill condition. And that can take anywhere from years to decades. And I'll show a, an example of this in just a few minutes. The Office of Response and Restoration is basically um, a nationwide office. We have uh, representatives everywhere from uh, Alaska all the, you know, all the way to uh, the East Coast. Um, our main offices are located in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is uh, uh, over here, and uh, Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Washington is uh, kind of the home base for the Emergency Response Division. Um, the uh, ARD folks are distributed across uh, the country as are ERD and marine debris. The last thing I want to highlight on this map is uh, the Disaster Preparedness Program is down here in Mobile, Alabama. The facility that they're located in is a hurricane-hardened facility that can serve as a command post in the event of a Hurricane Katrina or another Deepwater Horizon uh, type spill. They're centrally located in the Gulf Coast and uh, have all kinds of uh, resources at their disposal down there. So let's talk a little bit about oil spills and kind of the history of oil spills. Um, it wasn't that long ago, uh, pre, you know, mid 70s, that people didn't really know very much about what happened to spilled oil in the environment. Uh, ships would uh, sink and people would just kind of assume the oil would take care of itself and there wasn't really a whole lot of scientific research on it. Um, in 1976, NOAA established uh, the Spilled Oil Research Team to study the effects of oil and gas exploration in Alaska. And there was a number of different uh, researchers and um, specialties that were on this team. They had coastal geologists, they had marine biologists, they had chemists, oceanographers, uh, among other people that could go on scene uh, to study spills of opportunity. So a spill would happen and this team would fly out and they would basically start to uh, study what was going on with the oil and what was happening. Uh, the focus of this team was primarily uh, improving trajectories. They weren't really concerned about being an advisor or the biological impacts, but over time that role would change. Um, the first major deployment was the Argo Merchant, um, and that's the image in the background there. Um, and as time went on, this team uh, changed from the spilled oil research uh, team to the NOAA hazmat team. Uh, occasionally, you'll hear people informally still re refer to us as the NOAA hazmat team. But now we're referred to as uh, NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration Emergency Response Division. So a little bit about the Argo Merchant, because this is kind of a, an important uh, incident in our history as uh, scientific support coordinators. Um, in uh, 1976, uh, December 15th, not long before Christmas, 
Uh, the 641 foot uh, oil tanker Argo Merchant ran aground about 25 miles southeast of Nantucket. Um, the tanker was en route to Boston from Venezuela with 7.7, roughly 7.7 .7 million gallons of home heating oil or number six fuel oil. They had um, uh, a lot of, oops, sorry. They had a lot of uh, product on this vessel. Um, as they were leaving Venezuela, uh, there was nothing uh, really very interesting about their voyage, except for the fact that they had no electronics on board. They relied primarily on celestial navigation. Um, it wasn't because the electronics weren't on board, it's just because they weren't working. They had a broken gyro compass, their charts were old and out of date, they had a malfunctioning uh, radio direction finder. Basically, your cell phone had more uh, navigational capabilities than this vessel did. Uh, several days before they got underway, uh, the crew, a uh, few crew members had quit and they promoted someone from uh, the engine room to basically be a helmsman, so he was unqualified. And uh, there's going to be a theme about unqualified helmsmen here as I, as I continue. Uh, but as they were approaching Boston, they basically started to get off course and ran aground. Um, six days later, they weren't able to offload any of this product. Uh, the vessel kind of started breaking apart. The product was released into the environment. And up until that point, it was the worst uh, oil spill from a ship that was only exceeded by the Exxon Valdez 13 years later. But it's still one of the largest oil spills in US history, and it was one of the first oil spills that had scientific uh, support. Um, they, the, the people that were on scene started doing uh, very rudimentary versions of the things that we're continuing to do today. So this is a, an image basically kind of showing uh, the scale of modern tankers. I just think it's kind of um, important to recognize how things have kind of grown over time. As oil began getting shipped more and more, the size of the vessels uh, continued to grow. Uh, and the Argo Merchant there had about 7 million gallons, give or take, uh, on board. But just 13 years later, the vessels uh, were carrying, you know, many times that. The Exxon Valdez uh, was considered a very large crude carrier, of VLCC, and vessels today in the ultra large crude carrier size carry lots and lots and lots of oil, um, just kind of for scale. So this is uh, the Exxon Valdez, and I'm sure most people are familiar with this uh, incident. Um, it basically expanded the um, consideration of scientific support beyond just trajectories. Um, on March 24th, 1989, a third mate, a very unqualified person, was on the helm and the Valdez run aground in Bly Reef um, in Prince William Sound, Alaska, releasing nearly 11 million gallons of crude oil. Uh, as this crude oil kind of spread out, it started impacting about 1,300 miles of shoreline, and uh, instead of just trajectory, um, people there started to get concerned about the shoreline impact, and they created something called the Shoreline Cleanup Assessment Technique, sometimes called SCAT, and I'll show an example of what this looks like in a little bit. Uh, there were about 3,500 seabirds killed, 1,000 uh, mam marine mammals killed, and the natural resource and damage ass um, assessment uh, became a big part of this response. Um, this response also le led to the uh, OPA 90 or the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Um, so we've got two, uh, two big spills that have happened uh, due to unqualified helmsmen. And I was watching a documentary not too long ago about one of Christopher Columbus's ships that also ran aground, the Santa Maria, back in 1492. And the cause was an inexperienced helmsman. So those inexperienced helmsmen will always get you into trouble. Um, here is a timeline of recovery from Exxon Valdez oil spill. I just kind of throw this in here because, uh, as I said earlier, the best oil spill is one that does not happen. Uh, but this is basically a timeline of how long it took uh, different organisms to recover after uh, the incident in 1989. And as you can see, some of them didn't even uh, start to recover until almost 20 years uh, later. Uh, some species are still in the process of recovering and other ones are, uh, ha haven't recovered to their levels prior to the spill. So um, it's important to remember that uh, even if we are able to respond um, to these spills, there could be long lasting effects um, to these environments that the oil spills uh, happen in. So emergency response. Um, the um, scientific support coordinator is identified in the National Contingency Plan, and that's the federal government's plan for how to deal with these major oil spills. Uh, we're identified as a special team, and we provide the incident commander with uh, key scientific and technical information to support um, time-sensitive decisions. 
Um, we connect with the broader, um, you know, NOAA as, as a whole. Our, our office is only in one line office. There's many other line offices, such as NESDIS, which has a whole bunch of satellites that can be used to detect oil. There's the National Weather Service, because weather obviously um, can drive oil, um, you know, in, into different directions and having accurate weather forecasts is an important part of the response. Um, there's any number of things across NOAA that we can use to help uh, respond to these. Um, during oil spills, we also represent NOAA as, um, as a resource trustee. For example, um, commercial and recreational fisheries resources. Um, we have uh, endangered and threatened marine species, sensitive habitats, and other things that are considered trust resources um, that we act as a, um, a representative for um, during a spill. And then we also partner and communicate with federal and state agencies to coordinate capabilities. As a scientific support coordinator, we're trying to coordinate all of these different resources that can help uh, drive decision making during these um, uh, spills. Um, our scientific support coordinators are pretty much associated with US Coast Guard districts. Um, we have uh, District 1 up here, which is in New England. Uh, that's Steve Lehman and all the way down the, the East Coast. Um, my area of responsibility is District 9, which is pretty much the entirety of the Great Lakes uh, up to the Canadian border. Um, and as you can see, the area down in the Gulf is kind of the only one that doesn't really follow this because they have uh, so many spills, they've kind of broken it up um, from Houston to uh, New Orleans and Mobile. Um, but every other region more or less aligns with a, a Coast Guard uh, district. So we have scientific support coordinators who are out um, and uh, working with uh, our you know, Coast Guard partners, but scientific support coordinators wouldn't be anything without the scientific support team. Uh, so back in Seattle, we have uh, an entire team of experts who help us um, during these responses. We have oceanographers, we have biologists, uh, chemists, uh, data management specialists, SCAT coordinators, aerial observers, weather forecasters, and on and on, uh, who are able to provide uh, information on um, uh, you know, these, these specific incidents that basically uh, can change depending on the needs of an incident. Uh, depending on the scale of the incident, depending on the product type, depending on where it happened, when it happened, all of those different things um, can help drive the scientific support team composition. Um, so we couldn't uh, do our job without these folks. These are some of the uh, incidents over the years. So from about 2000, I guess it's 2009 to about 2018, this is showing uh, kind of the number of responses that we, um, that we responded to. And this is nationwide. This isn't just here in the Great Lakes. Um, there's uh, oil, uh, chemical, and other spills. And as you can see, there was a, a trend of um, you know, them going up. But at the same time, just because there's a lot of spills, it doesn't mean that that's a lot of effort. If you remember in 2010, that was the Enbridge oil spill and also the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So even though there might only be 100, uh, there's a, a huge amount of effort that went into dealing with spills in uh, 2010. Whereas you might have uh, you know, another year with 190, but 180 of them might be very small spills. So, uh, kind of keep that in mind just because there's a large number doesn't mean that every spill is massive. They can be relatively small. Um, we have a few chemical spills that we uh, respond to and then there's anything, um, there's other, that can be anything from, um, you know, whale carcasses to uh, drug bales or other things that we can uh, provide assistance with um, if we're called upon. This is a, a map showing um, kind of the locations of many of our spills. Obviously, a lot of them are uh, coastal. Uh, there's a large grouping of them down in the, the Gulf of Mexico, but you can have um, inland spills on inland rivers, uh, around the Great Lakes, et cetera. But um, there's spills happening year round uh, across the country and across the globe, really. Any place that oil is transported uh, via pipeline, via rail, ships, et cetera, um, you can have uh, the chance of they're being spilled oil. So when we do have um, an oil spill and ERD is activated, um, we're available 24 seven and we're committed to providing initial support um, to the Coast Guard when they request it. Um, all of our folks um, start working on the, prog the problem and we kind of use five questions to frame the problem. Uh, the five questions are what happened, where could it go? 
what could it affect, what harm could it cause, and what can be done to help. And these things uh, basically link back to many of our products. And I'll show that link here as we continue. Um, so doing things like uh, shoreline assessment and aerial observations can help us understand what happened. Uh, where will it go? That can be our trajectory. Things like the National Weather Service forecast can help us determine where it's going to go. Um, what can it hurt? Uh, those are the resources at risk. And I'll show you an example of that here in just a second. Um, what harm could it cause? Is there something that you know, is in the product that could potentially harm a community or a, uh, you know, some sort of natural resource that might be in the vicinity? And then what can be done to help? What sort of um, you know, cleanup strategies and endpoints can we look at to basically answer these questions? Um, as you can tell, it's, a, it's a, an ongoing cycle. It's not like once we get from one to five that the process is done. As more information becomes available, as we learn more about the incident, um, as uh, time goes on, these things can change. I mean, weather can change from day to day. Um, more information about the product might uh, come out, et cetera. Um, I didn't include any information in here about um, kind of uh, the background on oil and that sort of stuff. Um, if you're interested in the, those sorts of specifics about um, oil and its weathering and other sorts of things, uh, Bill Hazel did a presentation um, in the last um, um, Sea Grant presentation that you can view on their website that has a lot of really good information on kind of the weathering of oil and uh, things like that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our, uh, the tools that we developed to basically help answer those five questions. Uh, we have a GNOME suite, uh, which is our, um, our oil modeling environment uh, for basically determining a trajectory for where this uh, oil is going to go in, the, in, in water. Um, that's uh, part of our GNOME suite, and I'll show you the online version of that that you can actually access yourself. Um, there's a whole bunch of different tools that are part of that suite. Uh, we have the Cameo suite that I'll show you uh, here in just a, another few slides and the environmental sensitivity index maps. Uh, I'll show you an example of those as well, but there's something uh, specific about those that's actually taking place here in the Great Lakes uh, that I want to talk a little bit more about. So um, this kind of helps in the general phase, in the first phases of uh, a response because this will help identify the product, it'll help tell us where it's going, and it'll help identify some of those resources at risk. So this is an example of uh, an ESI map. Uh, the map in the background, you can see it has little uh, icons. It's got colors along the shoreline, um, and it's got a few different polygons that are kind of shaded in different colors. Um, these are all uh, what we call resources at risk, and ESI maps uh, include three of those things. So they include shoreline sensitivity, and if you look on the left side, it's got a scale of 1 to 10. And that basically, uh, a one is the least sensitive to oil and a 10 is the most sensitive to oil. So that helps uh, first responders determine which areas are gonna be uh, most important to protect to prevent that oil from getting into those areas. Uh, these maps also have information on biological resources like uh, where bird nests are, where birds are commonly found, where fish might be found, mammals, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and then finally, it has information on human use resources. If you look down in the lower right-hand corner, there's a little boat ramp. Um, there's things like uh, archaeological sites, um, you know, uh, boat ramps, uh, water intakes, et cetera, that might be listed on these maps. And these also help uh, first responders kind of make decisions, um, hopefully ahead of time. Hopefully, they're using these maps to, you know, develop their plans. But these are uh, available to take a look at and um, kind of help guide decision making. Here in the Great Lakes, uh, we're actually, if you, if you look back at these, these are kind of an older version. They're done on paper. Uh, we're actually starting the process of updating our ESI maps to be digital, kind of in a, 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 a GIS format that um, you know, will be online and available. Um, that process has already been kind of moving forward, and we're hoping to have these uh, new updated ESI maps for the Straits of Mackinac and also for the Detroit St. Clair River system, hopefully sometime in September and or October timeframe. Um, that's kind of the first set of maps that are gonna be coming out for the Great Lakes. And hopefully we can uh, get the funding to move forward with mapping and updating the, these maps for the entirety of the Great Lakes. Um, 
other tools that we that we have, uh, we have a, a product called Diver, which is a really good um, product for storing and, and sharing uh, response and assessment data. So during these responses, you're going to get tons and tons and tons of information from uh, photos to uh, your reports back to other things. And Diver is a tool that helps store all that information for future use. Uh, we have Irma, which is the environmental response management application, and I'll demo that here at the end of this uh, this uh, presentation. Um, there, it, it's basically a map generator. It's an, a GIS database that has layers that you can turn on and off to see different things. Um, we also have Response Link and Incident News, and I'll show you Incident News here shortly. Um, Cameo Suite. Cameo is a really cool tool that uh, allows um, people to basically look at different chemicals and their uh, reactivity. You can actually put in different um, uh, chemicals and it'll tell you whether or not you know, the two of them mixing will be a bad thing or not. Uh, this is available online. Uh, it's available as an app um, and it's also, uh, let's see, available as a desktop application as well. So you can download Cameo and it's a really uh, interesting tool. So SCAT and overflights. I talked a little bit about SCAT, which is uh, short for uh, Shoreline Cleanup Assessment Technique. And this is what a map looks like. Uh, obviously during a oil spill, you're not going to be able to have infinite amount of resources. So you're gonna have to try and determine which areas are gonna be heavily oiled, which would be these red areas here, and which ones aren't. And so the areas that are more heavily oiled are gonna end up getting more of those resources to clean up that oil versus areas that aren't. So those teams will go out and basically survey shorelines. And these are the sorts of things that get stored in, an app, in a product like Diver. Um, over here, uh, this is a, 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 just a general kind of depiction of what an overflight might be like. We're generating models through Gnome and trying to determine where the oil is gonna go, but those models aren't necessarily perfect. So we're gonna put people up in um, you know, helicopters or something else to go fly over these areas and determine if what the models are predicting uh, is accurate. Um, as you know, the future continues, obviously things like uh, UASs and UAVs are gonna become more prevalent to, um, to people actually flying around in helicopters just based on, on cost and uh, you know, the ease of deployment. Uh, those you know, uh, products are becoming uh, very cheap and very easy to use these days. Um, another thing that we do in, the, in this region is preparedness and training. We do a lot of uh, uh, training, exercise and drills, et cetera. Uh, recently, we had a, a SCAT course that we held in Mackinac City, Michigan in August of 2018. And we also had the Science of Oil Spills course uh, that we held in July of 2019 in Independence. Uh, we do about 40 drills every year across the country, and um, that includes things like the, an upcoming binational exercise called the Can You Slack exercise, which is a joint Canada-US Great Lakes exercise for uh, an oil spill that might happen um, you know, near the border that might cross across because the international border basically separates a lot of these lakes. And so if you have a spill that's large enough that's going to come across the border, uh, we need to be able to you know, practice what we would do as two countries dealing with a, a large oil spill. Um, another thing that we do is we have a ton of different job aids that are available for um, these uh, different sorts of uh, products and different sorts of environments and other things. Everything, um, I think Bill Hazel talked about this in his talk. Uh, most other regions outside of the Great Lakes uh, have dispersant application, but in the Great Lakes, dispersants are um, not. Uh, usable because obviously in the Great Lakes, uh, the water is fresh and we drink that water. Uh, so we don't want to put dispersants and oil into that water. Um, shoreline assessment job aid is something that goes along with uh, SCAT, everything from uh, open water oil identification job aid. And I'll show you where to get all of these um, on our website. So that takes me roughly to about halfway. And so now I'm going to shift away from PowerPoints and hopefully show you guys uh, some of these tools that are available for everyone to be able to go out to the web and check out. Um, here on our Office of Response and Restoration website, it's uh, response.restoration.noaa.gov, um, we have a whole bunch of information and it kind of breaks it down based on those different sort of um, uh, divisions we were talking about, marine debris, disaster preparedness, oil and chemical spills, um, so on and so forth. Um, you can scroll down and it gives a little bit of information on, you know, where the oil and chemical spills have taken place, 
Uh, there's information on Deepwater Horizon. Here in our toolbox, there's a whole bunch of different things that you can go and check out. Um, and I'm just gonna show you guys a few of those. So if you go up here to oil and chemical spills, um, it'll take you uh, to this page. Um, there are a whole bunch of different um, uh, tools and resources that are available here. If you go to um, this quick links, there's a, a brand new set of tools that we just released. If you click on oil types, it'll take you to this page. And we created a whole new set of oil fact sheets. Um, these are super interesting, um, uh, kind of quick one to kind of three page documents that kind of cover all of the primary um, products that get spilled a lot in the environment. So everything from biodiesel to denatured uh, ethanol spills, dielectric fluid spills, which is the product that was spilled in the Straits of Mackinac um, a while back. Um, there's Dilbit, heavy fuel oils, uh, non-petroleum oil spills, etc. And if you click on one of these, just click on a small diesel spill, it'll give you a kind of uh, an overall description of what to expect from uh, this. It'll give you a definition of what it is. It'll give you some of the properties and what to expect. Uh, so um, with a small diesel spill, for instance, uh, when it gets spilled on water, most of the oil will evaporate or naturally disperse within a few days or less. Uh, this is particularly true for typical spills from a fishing vessel, even in cold water, et cetera. Um, so you can go through and it'll give you some characteristics of, of um, the different types of products. It'll give you some information. Um, obviously, uh, when you spill diesel into the environment, even though it might evaporate, it's actually very acutely toxic. So it can um, have dire effects on fish and invertebrates and other uh, small critters in that um, area. So that's good things to know. Um, these are really interesting um, uh, products to kind of have on hand, especially if you're working with or planning for or um, you know, expect to see these types of, of products and you have them, um, you can have these on hand to, to refer to or to uh, get more information about those products. Um, so that's the diesel spills. If we go back here, uh, we could take a look at maybe a heavy fuel oil and I'll show you how some of this stuff is um, uh, generated here in just a, a second. So heavy fuel oils are dense and viscous and when they're spilled on water, they're going to spread out and they're not going to evaporate in quite the same way, it's saying only five to 10% is going to evaporate versus uh, the majority of a diesel spill. So if you have a diesel spill and it's on open water or somewhere that it's going to be able to evaporate, it probably won't have too much of a shoreline impact. But if you have a heavy fuel oil that gets spilled into the environment, it's going to persist, it's going to stick around, it's the stuff that you see that coats, um, you know, uh, birds and mammals and other things that uh, live near the water. Um, it's the real sticky, nasty stuff. Um, and you can go down and these oil budgets are straight out of Adios, which is another one of our products. And I'll show you guys some of what that looks like here um, coming up. We've also got our job aids uh, page. This is a whole bunch of uh, those documents that I was showing you earlier with the covers. So you can go in and click these and these are basically all the, the different um, job aids that are available. Um, you can you know, get them, they're just big P PDFs. So if you're working with a, an iPad or some other tablet, you can have these on there for um, you know, conducting your response. And let's go to incident news. So. Incident News is another one of our sites. If you're on the very first page here, you can click on Incident News right there. And what Incident News is, is it's a um, website that basically documents all of the reports that we get. We use a tool called Response Link that is uh, essentially the way you can think of it is, a, is as a blog platform. As an incident unfolds and we begin to collect information and we develop products and other things, we post those to Response Link, and Response Link helps to populate this website, Incident News. So if you are familiar with a, an incident, you can navigate to this website and click on, um, let's say for instance, uh, let's just do uh, this Lake Washington A10 wellhead. You can go down here and it'll give you information uh, about that spill. It'll give you a little pin. It'll tell you, you know, where it's at. It'll give you some information on the initial notification so that you can um, kind of identify that it's the one you're looking for. 
and it'll give you information on the incident details. So the primary threat from this incident was oil. Um, the total amount they're saying here is 129 gallons. It gives you a lap long, um, et cetera. But if you go down here, it'll give you uh, updates from the Coast Guard. It'll give you kind of a, a photo. This looks like an overflight photo. And you can see the sheen here, this rainbow sheen, some of that silver sheen out here on the water. Um, it'll give you a lot of information that's uh, available publicly. Uh, not every single thing that uh, goes on um, behind the scenes gets posted to this website, but it's a good resource uh, if you're interested in following up on uh, a specific incident. Um, another cool thing about this website is that you can go to a map, and let's just say load most recent incidents, and it'll actually give you uh, all of the incidents that have taken place um, in a given region. So if you want to know more information about um, a spill that's uh, happened. So this one here is the ground sunken vessel. Um, I think it's the towing vessel rawhide is what this one is it's saying it's in Northport, Michigan. And I'll re reference back to this here in just a second when we get to uh, Irma. But that's a towing vessel um, rawhide. And then you can go through, there's a sulfuric acid release, um, some pump discharge, and you can find out more information about all of these different uh, areas. If you have uh, questions on specific incidents that have happened in your area or you're curious, uh, this website pretty much contains uh, everything that's, that's going on that gets reported to us and uh, that we're supporting um, either the Coast Guard or our other partner agencies with. So you can go through and find out all of that information. It gives you, it'll give you, these are the most recent incidents, but you can go through and find uh, information about, you know, past incidents as well if you were doing a report or something, or you wanted to know about trends in specific areas, you can go through and check all that stuff out. All right, so I'm gonna switch now to IRMA, which is our Environmental Response Management application, and this is sort of our map uh, generator. And so, um, as I was saying before, you can go into this and, let me zoom out a little bit and kind of show you what, what's going on here. So if you zoom out here, and we uh, scroll down, let's see. So for a full access to this website, you need to go to the uh, login and need to have a login, but there's a whole bunch of different layers that you can activate and take a look at that don't require that sort of um, uh, login capabilities. So um, some of the things that you can access and something that I've had up is if we go down here to Let's see, is it response planning? I think it's actually under incidents and drills. So let's bring these up. So if you look down here, it says NOAA ORNR incident news. And so basically all of the most recent incident news, um, you know, incidents are here and you can turn them on. And if you guys remember uh, from the earlier example, this should be the rawhide once it loads. Uh, it's not loading, but uh, I promise you that that is the rawhide. But the cool things that you can do now, uh, if you go zoom into this, uh, are you can turn on, for instance, uh, RNC. So RNC stands for Raster Navigational Charts. And you can turn those on, and what that'll do is it'll bring up a navigational chart that NOAA also produces. And let's just zoom into this here. And what we can do is, if you right click on it, you can say send to back and it'll send it back. And that's where this incident took place. And say for instance, you were also interested in those ESI maps. So if you turn on the PDF ESI map index, um, you can get this um, layer up and it'll give you a whole bunch of these uh, red squares. And what these red squares are, are where these maps take place. So let's click on this one. And basically this is that ESI map for that region. It's showing you uh, that there's fish in this area, um, that there, it looks like there's parks, um, et cetera. And so you can use this ESI map to find out what um, resources at risk might be in that area. Um, I know that this map all by itself isn't super useful. So what you'll need to do is kind of scroll over in this. And if you go to something like, um, this legend file, what this will bring up is it'll give you more information on what all of these symbols mean. It'll give you information on this, uh, on what the 
you know, icons mean, and it also has some background information on interpreting ESI maps. And so these will hopefully one day get transformed into those new uh, um, GIS type um, layers. And so Irma has a whole bunch of different layers that you can turn on everything from uh, weather to infrastructure to, um, you know, any sort of layer that you want to see on this map, especially once you're logged in, you can bring it up. And so you can see all kinds of information about the region. You can zoom in and find out if, uh, you know, how shallow and how deep the water is in those areas. Uh, you can overlay all sorts of different layers. It's super, super powerful. So with the time I have left, I want to switch to um, the last tool that I want to show you guys that's also available online. It's, um, it says it's a draft working product. And so it's just um, something that's uh, available out there, but any product that comes out of this shouldn't be considered an official forecast without a, an actual NOAA uh, forecaster or oceanographer actually creating this file. But um, just there's a user's manual, uh, there's a location files, manual setup, there's a whole bunch of different things uh, that are available. There's an Audios Oil library, which is a really cool um, library of products that are kind of known to exist out in the, uh, out in the world. Um, and so you can go through there and it'll give you information, it'll give you API information, it'll give you all sorts of uh, information on all these different products. So we have all of these preset files in here that'll allow you to kind of pick uh, an area. And one of the ones that's here in um, this region in uh, the Great Lakes is the Detroit River. And so I'm gonna actually click load on that and we'll let that run and we'll click next. And so we'll just go with all of, all of these standard, um, you know, set uh, the preset. And so we have to have, uh, it'll, it says up here, the stage height must be between 170 and 180 meters. So we'll just start it at 170 and we'll end it at 180 down here and click next. Uh, wind. So we'll go through here. We're just going to have wind. Uh, we'll come at, have it come out of the north and we'll say at 10 uh, knots and we'll go with that. There are other options. Uh, you can go through and uh, select real-time wind. Let's just say instantaneous release. Uh, we'll call it uh, 10,000. Let's go with barrels. That's a huge amount of oil, but uh, let's just make it, make it big. Uh, we can go through and select our product, which will give us, this is what the oil library looks like. So you can go through and select all sorts of different oils that are, that are available. Uh, we'll just call it, uh, we'll call it generic heavy fuel oil. And we'll hit select. Um, we'll put it on a map. Let's just say we want it to spill from right there. Want to make sure that it's in the water. Um, and we'll click next. And we'll say the temperature, I don't know, the water temperature, I'm just going to kind of guess. We'll call it 60. Um, the salinity, we'll call it fresh water, and we'll say it's average river. Click next. And then we'll run the model. And so, oh, oops, I guess I ran the model the wrong direction. Uh, I probably should have done 180 and then 170. But as you can see, the oil, the oil would actually go uh, south, but in this instance, it's going north. Um, but as you can see, it's very quickly just generated uh, a model that's kind of showing where, where the oil uh, would go. You can save this trajectory as an, uh, an, an animated uh, GIF. Um, you can go through and do all sorts of uh, you know, editing if you want to go back and edit some of that information. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do um, from this model. So it's a very quick and easy way to basically um, generate a trajectory, especially if you're just kind of curious and um, you know, interested in, in uh, what an oil spill modeling looks like. Um, you can also go through and look at fate view. So as we were saying earlier with the different fuel types, uh, the diesel versus the heavy fuel oil, uh, it'll tell you how much uh, evaporates over time. So it kind of give you, gives you an oil budget. You can get it in a few different ways in a graph um, or in a table, et cetera. So it's a super powerful tool. Um, it's available online and it has a, a whole lot of stuff, more than I can show you. Uh, in this very short uh, demonstration. But uh, according to my watch, that's about all the time I have uh, for all these different kind of tools. There's a whole lot going on. Um, so if you guys have any questions, um, I'll turn it back over to Geneva and Mark and see where we're at.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, this is Geneva Langland over at Michigan Sea Grants Ann Arbor office. Um, we do have some questions in the question and answer box, and I would encourage folks to keep submitting those um, over the next uh, 15 minutes or so. We have actually several questions about joint um, efforts between US and Canada and how those two nations are able to share resources. Um, one of the questions, does the ESI map also give you sensitive areas on the Canadian side? So our ESI maps are specifically, the NOAA ESI maps are specifically for uh, the US side. Uh, Canada does maintain their own um, kind of set of those same sorts of maps. Uh, they recently did some updated uh, SCAT information and we do share information, especially during responses. But um, the, the ESI maps that I showed you specifically are for the US. Great, thank you. Um, and similarly, does the Canadian Coast Guard or is there another agency in Canada that has a tool similar to incident news? Um, and can that ever be integrated with the US version of incident news? Um, I, that is a very good question. I do not know if they have um, a similar tool. Uh, generally, we, it would be the Canadian Coast Guard or um, Ministry of the Environment or another one of the uh, Canadian agencies that we would be working with during an actual incident, but it's usually as part of the um, incident command, not uh, just getting information from the web. So I, I don't know. That might be a, a quick Google search to find out. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess in a similar vein about um, how responsibilities are shared across different jurisdictions, um, we have a question about cooperation and preparedness when dealing with uh, spills that happen within tribal boundaries or within ceded territories. Um, and the question asker has an example, um, if an oil spill on the Bad River um, would contaminate reservation shoreline or reservation waters, um, how would that necessarily be handled? Yeah, thanks. That's a, a great question. Um, so we do, like I said earlier, we have a lot of, uh, you know, exercises that we participate in. And I know that um, a lot of our partners are very interested in working with tribal folks. And so we try to incorporate um, information from, um, you know, tribal resources and other uh, folks that are out there into uh, the response. So if there's something that's not mapped. Uh, most of our ESI maps, I think, cover, uh, or and if not ours, the EPA maintains a set that are called the Inland Sensitivity Atlas that uh, are less coastal and more inland, and they have information there as well. So if that information isn't known on one of those two sources, uh, hopefully there would be a tribal expert that would be incorporated into the response um, to try and get that information so that we know um, uh, what we're you know trying to protect. I know, for instance, uh, during that SCAT training up in Mackinac City, we had um, uh, someone from the Little Traverse Band of Odawa Indians in the course who was giving us information about uh, rice and other things that are important to the tribal community and, and trying to make sure that uh, those sorts of resources were, um, you know, protected in the event of an oil spill. So uh, there's a lot of information out there and I think it's just uh, making sure that we maintain good relationships so that we can get that information. Excellent, thank you. Uh, here's another question from the box. What are the triggers that would prompt the Coast Guard to request assistance from NOAA scientific support? Um, surely there has to be sort of a threshold for when something is worth escalating. Um, I don't know if there's a set um, like amount, but I think it's basically, you know, anything that might be uh, uh, like the, the threat to the environment. Um, it's not like as if we say there's a, a, you know, a 50 gallon spill versus a 500 gallon spill. And if it's 50, they don't call. And if it's 500, they do call. I think it's mostly like, um, you know, once there's a, a threat that's to the environment, they start to contact us. Uh, you know, a, a 10 gallon gasoline spill, eh, maybe not, but you know, any sort of sunken vessel, we generally get contacted any sort of uh, a ground ship that might have a 10,000 gallon potential, um, you know, it, it's once it starts to get to a point where it could have a, a significant impact on the environment is when they, they contact us. Um, but again, we encourage them to contact us anytime that uh, they need us. I mean, if they want to contact us for a 20 gallon spill, we'd be more than happy to provide support to that. 
Sure. Is that the same kind of paradigm for what makes it onto incident news? Uh, well, yes. So anything that we're contacted for would be on incident news, but we don't sure. keep track of every, you know, tiny. I mean, the, the, the rules are any sheen in the water needs to be reported um, to the, um, needs to be reported, but that uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the scientific support coordinator gets contacted for all of those. Yep, that makes sense. Um, I would encourage folks to keep submitting your questions to the question and answer box. We've got some great ones that have come through so far and we've got time for more. Um, here's a question that I've been asking all of our participants on this webinar series. What are some things that you see coming on the horizon for oil spill response in the next five or 10 years? What are you excited about in this field? That's a good question. Um, I think there's uh, just, I think in general, and I think it's kind of the direction the world is kind of going um, and it's sort of spilling over into oil spill response. But like I was talking about before, the whole UAV, UAS world and kind of autonomous, um, you know, oil spill recovery. Like right now, um, if you have a, a large enough spill in the water, you're kind of coordinating between models and overflights and getting vessels out there. And I know that recently there's been work on kind of uh, autonomous oil skimmers that are able to detect oil and then you know, find the, you know, the source of that oil and go back and, and uh, survey them. There've been work, you know, the harmful algal blooms are another big thing in the Great Lakes. And there's been work on developing, um, you know, autonomous, um, you know, vehicles that can go out and sample and do things like that. And I think that that's the same sort of stuff that's going to end up coming into this world. I mean, I don't know about five years, but maybe 20 years, I could see it mm. becoming a regular part of uh, oil spill response. Um, and I think in general, you know, that's just, it seems to be uh, a lot of the autonomous stuff and, and uh, remotely controlled things are sort of coming into existence. Yeah, that, that has been a theme that's been coming up across these webinars is there is a lot of kind of interesting technology when it comes to remote and autonomous uh, underwater vehicles that can help us look and act in places that we might not have been able to look or act before. Sure. And I think too, it helps, you know, as much as people want to be um, involved in some of these things, especially stuff like uh, chemical spills or, you know, some sort of uh, really volatile uh, oil product, uh, who knows, you know, there's any number I could name, but uh, the um, idea of keeping people away from that and not having to have first responders be directly involved, if there's some way to kind of have a, you know, remotely operated response, it helps keep people safe, right? I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's interesting stuff to kind of think about. And it'll be interesting to kind of see how it ends up playing out in the in the future. You know? mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of a, a merging of questions and something that I'm curious about. How how does it look teasing out the responsibilities between the US and the Canadian response teams if a spill were to happen on the Canadian side, if it example, for example, came from Sarnia, Ontario, what what would the balance of responsibilities look like with that? Uh that would it would definitely involve a discussion. Uh the Coast Guard would be the primary point of that discussion with the the Canadians because they're the uh on scene. Uh, coordinators or incident commander for the U.S. side, but uh, if it was a Canadian spill, the Canadians would primarily be, you know, involved in responding to it. Um, mm -hmm. But the the actual hashing out of the details would be between the two countries. And there there are some structures in place, like the joint, like I, I mentioned, the National Contingency Plan. That's the federal government's, you know, plan for how we respond as a, as a country. But there's also the Joint Contingency Plan, which is between Canada and the U.S. And those sorts of things kind of are contained in there. And that's one of the reasons we have these exercises is to work out areas where, you know, we might not be coordinated and there might be some speed bumps and to try and smooth those out so that if something really does happen, we know, you know, how to respond better. Sure. So you walked through how the different types of incidents that the um, that your team would respond to are categorized. There's the oil spills, there's the chemical spills, and you mentioned a couple of things that fit into the other category, like a whale carcass. What are some other types of things that might, even if they're just sort of one-off incidents that might fit into that other category? Um, 
Let's see. There are kind of a number of different um, kind of interesting um, responses that kind of come up uh, from time to time. And I'm trying to think of like a good one that's related to um, maybe the Great Lakes. I mean, a lot of times it'll end up being things like, um, like, let's see, that's, that's kind of a chemical. Uh, they've done modeling for uh, Spartina seeds. Uh, they've done modeling for, um, you know, unfortunately things like crimes where a body will wash up and we're able to use our modeling to basically kind of uh, do a hind cast and figure out where that may have washed up from. And I know there was a, a case, I don't know the specifics of it, but where somebody was saying that they, you know, the local folks asked for assistance and they said, we're hundred percent sure it came from this bridge. And when they mm -hmm. ran the model backwards, it basically did not, there's, there was no way they could make it come from that bridge. And so they oh, wow. thought that it actually came from another location, um, which, you know, can be useful if it's uh, used. Um, but basically anything that's kind of floating on water, um, we can kind of, kind of model in some ways. So those sorts of things. And like I mentioned, drug bales is basically the same thing. Like what sorts of vessels were in the vicinity when this washed up on this beach, you know, if you go right. backwards and find out where, where it sort of came from. And, uh, you know, there was, a, I think the Humphrey, the wayward whale, they were <laughs> kind of tracking this whale that swam up a river and they had to try and chase it back out into the, uh, into the, um, the ocean where it belonged. Mm -hmm. I heard somebody was telling me the story that they, um, gosh, I remember all the specific details, but it was uh, basically that they lured the whale back out into the ocean by playing whale songs into the water to basically get it to follow the boat with the whale songs. And it actually worked. <laughs> that is so, impressive. That's yeah. a creative way to solve that problem. No doubt. <laughs> Uh, we had one person write in and say that there was a discharge of plastic pellets in Sarnia that got treated as one of those other uh, mm -hmm. categories as well. Yeah. Yeah. With, uh, we work with the Marine Debris Program for some, some of those things. And uh, sometimes, too, uh, shipping containers will fall off mm -hmm. ships. And those are another, like, they're a hazard to navigation. Um, and, you know, you obviously don't want to hit one of those. And so they'll uh, issue, you know, notices about that as well. Um, yeah, any number yeah. of things. Not necessarily in our waters, but every once in a while you hear those stories about a shipping container full of rubber ducks or Lego pieces or right. Garfield right. telephones that get spilled. And that's uh -huh. not, not a thing you'd ever expect to have to clean up, but you never know what's going to uh, come here. Another famous one of uh, tennis shoes that uh, washed ashore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this was pre, uh, maybe pre uh, modern internet anyway, where they were they were forming clubs of people to try and find matching shoes so that you could have a matched pair. <laughs> now so. there's a, a dubious distinction. I have a, a drowned pair of tennis shoes that I may right. never want to wear, but I have them. <laughs> For sure. Um, so we've got about two more minutes. Uh, if you have any burning questions, feel free to submit them into the Q&A box. Um, here's another one. How do vessels avoid hitting AUVs in the Great Lakes? How do vessels avoid hitting AUVs? Uh, I guess that would depend on the people operating the AUVs. I don't think that vessels themselves, as far as I know, would be able to even know that they were there, especially if yeah. they're below the surface. Um, I would think that they would just have them operate deep enough and perhaps, uh, you know, they might have some sort of sensors. I know that my personal little uh, drone has like proximity sensors on it that prevent it from crashing into things. So I would hope that much more expensive models may have something similar. Yeah, that sounds like an important safety feature. Yeah. All right, well, I'm not seeing any last minute questions sliding into the box and we are at 2.59, so. So this is Mark Breederland and I just wanted to, to say a special thanks to uh, Lieutenant Doig and for his great work and for the uh, closing off our, uh, our webinar series that started in June of 2019 and and uh, concluded with today's program. And, and again, that'll be on our uh, website, glslcrudeoiltransport.org, and hopefully be a, uh, a great resource in the future. So Mike, thanks for all the great tools and Geneva, the communication support that you did. So thank you so much. And just wanna wish everybody a great day. Yeah, thank you guys again. And hopefully uh, somebody learned something new.